Hi everyone, my name is Anika Kumar. Hope you guys all are having a great day. Um, thanks for coming to visit our passage walkthrough. Today I'm going to be walking us through a sample bio MCAT passage. Um, so hopefully I'm going to be sharing some great tips and tricks and strategies that I like to use when approaching these types of passages and hopefully you'll find some of them helpful. Um, before we start, I just wanted to say that normally I like to spend about eight minutes on the MCAT general science passages, but Today, since we're going to be walking through my entire thought process and talking out loud, it's going to take a little bit longer. So let's get started. Um, all right, so I think the most important thing before we start reading the passage is to note that we always wanna make sure we're reading as actively as possible. And so that means underlining key terms, um, making mini outlines in our head and just sort of checking for comprehension as we go. So let's start with the passage. Post-operative acute kidney injury is a severe complication after liver transplantation, as its deterioration and magnification can lead to an increase in mortality. So here we're already seeing post-operative acute kidney injury, which seems like the main biological concept of this passage. Um, moving forward, Connexin 43 mediates direct transmission of intracellular signaling between neighboring cells, always considered to be the potent biological basis of organ damage, deterioration, and magnification. So here we're now seeing connexin 43, um, and that mediates direct transmission of signals between cells. Um, so these are kind of some main big picture concepts that we might want to pay attention to. We're not sure how in depth we need to know about these until we get to the questions. Moving forward, researchers obtained donor liver tissues of patients in order to explore the effects of connexin 43 on organ damage. So I always like to look out for these sentences where they basically explicitly tell you what the researchers are looking at the relationship between. So here we're seeing effects of connexin 43, which seems like it sounds like kind of an independent variable on organ damage. That sounds like kind of a dependent variable. Reperfusion is a biological process used to refill blood in AKI. Donor livers displayed more severe lobular distortion with necrosis, apparent edema, hemorrhage, and neutrophil infiltration after reperfusion compared with donor liver tissues obtained before reperfusion or normal liver tissue from patients with hepatic hemangioma. So here we're just noting um, a type of comparison, and these are always important to note in this particular situation. We want to look at what the wild type or the base case or the control would be, and in that case, that would be the normal liver tissue. So here we're looking at the difference between um, a donor liver after reperfusion and normal liver tissue. It sounds like there might be some information or a figure about this later. CX43 mRNA and protein levels were determined as shown in figure one. So um, here we're looking at mRNA and protein levels. That sounds like a dependent variable, and now we're looking at figure one. So now let's get to the figure. I like to recommend only spending like 15 to 30 seconds on a figure during the first pass of a passage, and if a question asks for a more detailed um, approach, you can always go back and look at it. But the reason I do that is because sometimes particular figures won't even be mentioned in the question, so you don't wanna waste too much time um, studying every single pattern and then not end up having to use it in the questions. So here, um, I like to use a TAIDP approach, which stands for title, axes, independent, dependent variable, and patterns. So let's start with the title. Here, it's looking like we are looking at CX43 mRNA and protein levels in normal or donor livers before reperfusion and after reperfusion. So a lot going on. Now let's look at the axes. It looks like we have two parts to this figure. In the first one, we have three different groups, and we're measuring CX43 mRNA levels as our dependent variable. The second part of the figure looks like a western blot where we're looking at CX43 protein levels and B actin or B tubulin sometimes um, are very common uh, types of proteins used as controls in western blot to show that the western blots are working. Okay, moving forward. Autologous orthotopic liver transplantation rats were built by researchers in order to further study AKI. Researchers hypothesized the change in connexin 43 expression might play an important role in AKI following AOLT. So here we have another sentence talking about um, a hypothesis where an independent variable could potentially be change in connexin 43 and the dependent variable could be um, AKI following AOLT. Researchers use heptanol, a well-known inhibitor of connexin 43 without hepatotoxicity, to alter the function of junctions composed of CX43. Heptanol had no effects on CX43 expression in kidneys or livers. So here we're looking at researchers using heptanol. That sounds like an independent variable, something that the researchers are manipulating in the experiment. Um, and we know that that's an inhibitor of connexin 43. And that looks like it's altering the function of junctions somehow. We noted from the earlier paragraph that connexin 43 is very important for junctions. 
Okay, heptanol or a sham control were injected intravenously into the rats and the pathological score of kidney cells was determined to analyze disease progression. The results are shown in figure two. So this is a great sentence that you might want to star um, because it's basically explaining what we're going to be looking at in figure two. Um, and so let's use that same approach to sort of decipher what figure two means. Um, we're looking at the title, which is the pathological score of AOLT mice treated with the Connexin 43 inhibitor. Okay, um, going into the figure, now let's look at the axes. Um, we have number of hours after reperfusion as it, it, it's increasing over time. Um, and on the y-axis, we have pathological score. And we know that that was a dependent variable. It said that in the previous paragraph. Um, we also want to note that there are four different treatment groups here. We have a sham group, we have a heptanol versus sham group, we have an AOLT group, and we have an injection and AOLT group. And it looks like sham would be the control in this case. Um, okay, moving on, researchers also believe that the RIP1 may be involved in connexin 43 function, and they confirmed the interaction of the proteins through co-amino precipitation. So now it looks like we're talking about potential protein interactions that might be important related to connexin 43. Um, RIP1 is a typical marker of necroptosis. Okay, so now we're talking about RIP1. All right, so that was a great walkthrough of the passage. I feel like we really sort of understood some of the key topics that might show up in the questions, and we got sort of a preliminary understanding of the experiments that the researchers used, as well as some of the data and the figures. So now let's move on to the questions to sort of test our understanding. Okay, let's start with number one. What type of junction does connexin 43 most likely form? So um, for this particular question, we want to go into where the passage talks about what connexin 43 is, and that ended up being in passage one. So there's a sentence in here that literally says, connexin 43 mediates direct transmission of intracellular signals between neighboring cells. So we want to look for the type of junction that is related to tr direct transmission of signals between cells. So if these four answer choices are terms that you are unfamiliar with, then you may want to spend a little bit of time reviewing junctions because this is a topic that might come up on the MCAT. But if we look at these choices, the, uh, the type of junction that is related to signal transmission between cells ends up being gap junction. So A is the correct answer for this one. Tight junctions are um, more related to preventing leakage of things and desmosomes are more related to adhesion. So that's kind of out of the scope of what this is particularly asking for, um, but in that case, A would be correct. All right, moving on. Number two, a researcher discovers a new connexin 43 inhibitor made of a glycerol backbone and three saturated fatty acid tails. Which of the following describes the path by which the inhibitor enters the cells? So another important MCAT topic that might come up is how things enter the cells. And so typically there are sort of two main groups of molecules that you want to think about, the really hydrophobic ones and the really hydrophilic ones. And so hydrophobic ones can pass through the hydrophobic membrane and usually they interact with specific receptors within the cells. Whereas hydrophilic cells aren't nonpolar enough to get through the membrane, so they have to interact with receptors on the membrane so they don't get to make it all the way in. And so we want to think about this particular inhibitor and what class that would fall into. So here we see that it is made of a glycerol backbone and three saturated fatty acid tails. So glycerol is a type of lipid, and three saturated fatty acid tails are basically just really long hydrocarbons with no um, double bonds. And so we want to think about whether or not that would be a really polar or nonpolar molecule. So I'll give you guys a second to think about it. So if you said that this is a really nonpolar molecule, you are correct. And because it's nonpolar, it will be hydrophobic and it will be able to pass through the membrane. And so for those reasons, answer choice C is the correct answer to this question. Okay, moving on. Researchers decide to interrupt the connexin 43 RIP1 interaction in the AOLT rat model without using a small molecule inhibitor. Which of the following will most likely disrupt the interaction? So here we're talking about the protein-protein interaction that was mentioned in the last paragraph of the passage, and we want something that will disrupt that interaction. So let's look at some of the answer choices to see what would fit best. So answer choice A is siRNA for RIP1. So siRNA uh, represents short interfering RNAs, and those are just RNA sequences that ta uh, target specific mRNAs and degrade them. So if you have short interfering RNAs, they interfere with transcription, translation, and they end up leading to decreased levels of production. So that sounds like a compelling option because if we're interfering with RIP1, um, that will definitely inhibit the interaction with connexin and RIP1. Um, so that's a compelling option, but let's look at the others before we pick that one. Um, radiation against heptanol. 
So I do know that a lot of times researchers will use radiation or EMS to mutagenize things. Um, however, if we're, if we're just using radiation against heptanol, radiation may affect tons of other things within the cell, and we don't really know if it's going to be specific for connexin 43 RAP1 interaction. So while radiation will disrupt the interaction likely, um, we don't know whether or not it'll mess up a lot of other things too that are kind of unrelated. C, acetyltransferase specific for B actin. So acetyltransferases are important enzymes that basically change the, molec the molecular structure of a molecule. However, it's talking about B actin, and we did not really, uh, we didn't really talk about B actin in the passage, if we recall. The only time B actin was present was um, in the Western blot when it was used as a control, but it wasn't really involved in any of the experiments, or it doesn't seem to be relevant to um, the topics discussed. So as a result, this question, this answer choice seems like it's kind of out of scope and maybe not the right one. Finally, answer choice D, plasmid producing connexin 43. So plasmids are important biological tools that researchers will sometimes use as vectors to allow organisms to take in foreign DNA. And so this seems interesting. Now we're injecting a plasmid that produces CX43. So say the organism does take up this plasmid and they do integrate that foreign DNA, um, that will only result in an increase in connexin 43 production. Um, and so that would likely actually enhance the connexin 43 RAP1 interaction because now you're having more connexin 43. So it's, there isn't really clear that this would actually disrupt the interaction. And so for those reasons, with process of elimination, A seems like it would be the best answer. Okay, finally, last question. Which conclusion about connexin 43 regulation is best supported by figure one? So now it's telling us explicitly to look back at the passage at figure one, which is great because we already have kind of a preliminary understanding of it and now we can look at it more in depth. So here we're looking at this first part, which is um, more of the transcriptional approach to the experiment. And the second part is more of the translational approach to the experiment as we discussed. So let's look at the answer choices and see which, which one fits best. So A, all expression control or occurs at the transcriptional level, and B, all expression control occurs at the translational level. So here we have very two extreme answers, and if we look at the figure, we do see that there are changes in mRNA expression between groups, and there are changes in protein expression between groups, right? Like the bars are of different heights in the first figure, and the um, protein doesn't show up in certain columns of the second figure. So that means that there are effects in both the transcriptional and translational realms. So I don't think we can say that all of the expressional control happens on one of these levels. And for those reasons, we can go ahead and eliminate A and B. Now let's look at answer choice C to see if that one's correct. Donor livers have higher levels of connexin 43 after reperfusion when compared to normal liver tissue. So here we're comparing two groups and we're looking at levels of connexin 43. Um, so on one hand, we can look at the transcriptional graph. We see that the um, donor livers after reperfusion, that's this bar right here. And then we have the normal liver tissue, which is this bar right here. And we see there are higher levels of connexin 43 in the donor liver tissue. Also in the translational realm, um, this column represents the donor liver uh, tissues after reperfusion, and this one represents the normal. And we can see that there is connexin 43, and the band is not really pronounced in the normal column. So as a result, C looks like it would be a good answer. Let's just double check that D is wrong uh, before we go forward and select that one. Normal livers treated with heptanol have lower levels of connexin 43 compared to donor livers treated with heptanol. So heptanol was actually not really introduced in the passage until later, um, figure one does not have heptanol involved in it in any way. That's not an independent variable in question here. And so we can go ahead and eliminate that one because this first figure doesn't really tell us anything about the effects of heptanol. So with that, we can go ahead and select answer choice C. So as you can see, as we look through these questions, there are a few that required us to um, go in and actually find particular places in the passage where we could look for the information. But there are also some questions that really heavily recall, relied on recall um, and just you know content background that hopefully we are gaining as we study. Um, and so this is what you'll see uncommonly in your bio passages. There will typically be sort of a mix of these two questions. And so you want to be prepared for all of them.